is the Palin Update on Mama Grizzly Radio. I'm Kevin Shola in the new Full Battle Rattle Studios. The laws that are on our books, American administrators and law enforcement officers cannot enforce our laws. Why have them on the book then? The sheriff is in town. Chester County, Pennsylvania Sheriff Bunny Welsh is here, fresh off a meeting with the President of the United States. Welsh, one of the few women to serve as a county sheriff in this country, and she had a seat right next to Donald Trump in Washington, D.C. this past week. Today, we learn about what was said, and we get the sheriff's thoughts on how the Trump administration will be a big positive for law enforcement everywhere. Sheriff Bunny Welsh coming up from Pennsylvania. Plus, we'll have the latest national and Alaska headlines in Sarah Palin News. We'll visit the Crow's Nest with Tanya Crow in California. Also from the Golden State, Kelly Carlson is on target. The Millennial Forecast with Sarah Hagmeyer is coming up from New Jersey. And a brand new installment of Liberty and Legacy with Tamara Colbert on the way from Texas. Welcome to the Palin Update on Mama Grizzly Radio. The Palin Update is sponsored by Full Battle Rattle. Full Battle Rattle, helping veterans suffering from combat-related disabilities through the healing power of music. Learn more at facebook.com slash fullbattlerattleabq. President Trump made law and order a central plank of his campaign, and he was backed by much of the law enforcement community. This past week, the president met with a group of sheriffs at the White House, and he was given a letter of thanks for his recent executive actions to crack down on illegal immigration. Among the attendees, Sheriff Bunny Welsh of Chester County, Pennsylvania, and she was up close and personal with the Prez. We're happy to talk all about that today on the program. And right now, Sheriff Bunny Welsh joins us on the Palin Update on Mama Grizzly Radio. Sheriff, thank you for being here tonight. Well, thank you for having me. We really appreciate you being here and an amazing experience for you, a visit with the President of the United States, and we want to get to that in just a moment. You know, I do want to first, a little background on you for our listeners. I interviewed you a while back on uh, my television show with former Delaware County Sheriff of Pennsylvania, Joe McKinn. And when I saw you on television uh, with the president, I said, there's Buddy Welsh. And I remember her telling me <laughs> off the air that she liked Sarah Palin as much as I did. And I said, oh, boy, we got to get her on the program. So, you know, I know things have changed a little bit since we last spoke. And I know uh, there have been there has been some movement in this area. But I know that when I interviewed you the first time, you were the only woman sheriff in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania out of 67 counties. That's correct. But there currently is another female sheriff, and it happens to be the sheriff in Delaware County, uh, Mary Hopper, who replaced Joe McGinn. So there are currently two female sheriffs in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Isn't that funny? I asked you that question years ago, and then the county that I was covering has the other woman sheriff. So... We're still kind of a rarity, though. Out of the 3,000 and, I believe, 80 sheriffs in the nation, still are only about 38 women. Well, and, yeah, and you know, and that's another reason. I mean, I wasn't even really paying attention to what was on the screen, and the reason I looked up right away was because you were noticeable. I said, hey, I know her. And you you know what's great, too, uh, Sheriff, is that, you know, you look at these – Uh, situations here on this program now that i've had joe arpaio david clark and bunny welsh on the show i could say i've had the big three on this program (laughs) well thank you i'm uh, honored to be in that company now the president let's talk about uh why you were meeting i know we met with a lot of sheriffs from across the country so how did you uh get selected for this what did you talk about and how'd you get to sit right next to him during the television part well uh there with the national sheriff's association had a uh, their midwinter meeting in Washington, D.C. And we knew that the president had been invited to be a speaker to the general meeting, which was the following day, a meeting of the major county sheriffs and the major city police chiefs. However, the invitation was extended that he would meet in the Roosevelt Room with 10 sheriffs from across the nation, And uh, I was one of the 10 sheriffs. I'm in leadership of the National Sheriffs Association. And that we would meet with him in the Roosevelt Room on Wednesday morning. And, of course, it was very excited, A, to have that meeting in the White House, and B, to be one of the 10 sheriffs selected to be there with the president. Um, 
the seating arrangement, very interesting. Um, when we entered the room after going through security and so forth, our names were placed on the table. So each sheriff, I was in there with the sheriff from uh, Texas, North Carolina, Wyoming, uh, Kentucky, all over the country. And I, we were told to go to the place in the table where our name tag was, and I did. And we were to stand there until the president entered the room. And to my left was a sheriff from Texas. And then to my right was an empty chair. And then to that right was the president of the National Association, a sheriff from Louisiana. And I had chatted with a few people in the room, uh, Kellyanne Conway, who I'd met um, during the campaign. And I said, oh, who's sitting in this chair? And they said, the president. <laughs> well, I think I re- I think I I know I didn't squeal audibly, but it was an internal kind of squeal, you know, thinking, wow, you know, he's going to sit right next to me. So uh, when he entered the room, of course, he greeted a few of us. And just like the gentleman he is, he came up and the chairs are very heavy and it's a very thick carpet. And he said, let me get the chair for you. And he pulled the chair out so I could sit down. And I felt my se- myself saying, thank you, Mr. President, almost like it was a line out of a movie. Yes, you know? yes. I felt like somebody had scripted and I'm saying, thank you, Mr. President. It's almost as if it was surreal, you know, but it was wonderful. And he's so gracious and such a gentleman. So he pulled the chair out and I sat down and my place for the rest of the meeting was right at the left hand of the president. Well, you deserve it. We were happy to see you there. And, you know, n- not only that President Trump is there, but, you know, these sheriffs that we back so much through these tough eight years and, and moving forward. You know, I mentioned uh, Clark and others who've been on this program and, and just others that have dealt with so much over these last few years, a, a lot more than we've seen in the past, obviously. You know, um, Sheriff, I, I've talked to you in the past a little bit about Governor Palin, but, you know, you remind me of her in a lot of ways. One, you know, you mentioned the lack of women that are sheriffs, the percentages and, you know, breaking into that boys club. She has done similar things along the way, whether it be the governorship or also the uh, national ticket that she ran on. But also just the fact of being a champion for common sense and being somebody that is out there and, you know, talking about real things and also being a real person. And and the reason I say that about you is that, you know, through all of your accomplishments and everything through uh, your sheriff's office and things you've done, you know, what impressed me the most about you when I asked you who your top influence is, who's, you know, your role model, for lack of a better term, you said your dad. <laughs> and, and, I, and I mean, isn't that exactly what we need in this country, whether it's law enforcement or just regular parents? I mean, the fact that you know, the parents are the real heroes and the ones making decisions for everyone. And I love that about you because I know Governor Palin would say something similar about her parents. <laughs> well, yeah, and and it's true. It's true to this day. Uh, my mother, bless her heart, uh, just passed away. She went home to be with the Lord at the end of the year last year. And she was 95, She almost 95, and she lived a wonderful life. And one of the last things she did, she made, uh, I made her two promises. She wanted to be at home, which she was. She didn't want to be in a facility or a, a rehab or, or, or any um, care facility. And she wanted to vote. She was a Donald Trump fan, 94 years old, sharp as a tack. Her mind was just as sharp as a tack. Her little body was crumbling, but her mind was sharp. And uh, I sent for her absentee ballot. And one of the last things she did was proudly, I even um, took video of it, cast her ballot strongly for Donald Trump. And I thought of her uh, ever since then. I was an elector in the Electoral College, and so many things have happened. And every once in a while, I think of my mom and my dad and just have a great sense of of knowing that they would be very proud of what's happening. You know, I think that Trump really is someone who was able to get that type of broad support. I mean, I've seen the same thing from friends and family in my personal experience. My grandmother, who's 91, loves him, you know, from day one, yes. voted for him in the primary. And then my son, who was five during the campaign, it probably knocked on more doors than any five-year-old in this country that wasn't related to the president. So, I mean, you know, people really relate to the fact of the way he speaks, the way he is just like everyone else. I mean, I say Palin-esque in that way, too, you know, to go back to the yeah. governor, because, you know, it's real terms. It's not teleprompter reading. It's not legal speak. It's not uh, politics. 
arrests. And you see that already early on in his administration, what he's doing with law enforcement and in other areas. I mean, Energizer Bunny all the way. I don't think he sleeps. And he's on top of so much already. And what are we, a couple weeks in? It's unbelievable. Yeah, and not only that, but there's a, a. I was able to meet him several times during the campaign, and I've been known myself to occasionally be a little outspoken. And uh, the fact <laughs> another reason was, you're on the show. <laughs> and the fact that he's I use unfiltered or uh, not politically correct is a lot of the appeal as he went through the campaign, and uh, he's genuine. When you meet him, when I first met him, which is uh, way back. Uh, a year ago, and he came to Westchester University. Right. He took time, and then there was 16, 17 people in the primary. And he came in, I introduced myself to him, and he thought it was you know, kind of cool, it was a woman sheriff and so forth. But he took the time with all the law enforcement there. Uh, you had the Secret Service, you had the state police, you had the university police, the local police, deputy sheriffs, canines. He took the time to thank each one of them, shake their hands. If they wanted a selfie, go ahead and take it. Genuinely engaged with them. And that's rare with politicians. Usually a politician talks to you and he or she's looking over your shoulder to see who the next person is they should meet. Right. And when you talk to Donald Trump, he lasers right in on you. I mean, it's eyeball to eyeball. He talks to you. He's engaged. He wants to hear what you have to say. And it's a very genuine quality that you don't see in, unfortunately, in elected officials. And I came out very strongly for him in the beginning. I was, uh, wasn't a long line behind me. And yep. I was very bold about my stance. And I took some heat for it. And uh, that was okay. I felt very strongly that there was only one person in that race that could turn things around and it wouldn't be business as usual. And it was Donald Trump. Oh, you got it. And I love the way you put that, you know, looking over at the handlers of who do I need to talk to next. And and also from an application standpoint, they're looking at polls. They're looking at how will I be perceived instead of doing what he believes is right for the country. And, and you're even seeing it now. I mean, I don't think anybody else would have beaten Hillary. But if any of the other 16 did get in right now and was the president, some of the heat he's being taken now for whether it be the, uh, the ban of the seven uh, countries or uh, anything – you could see some capitulation or backing down from others. And the fact that he doesn't, I mean, even if you disagree with him on certain things, you know you're getting an honest shake and you're getting what he really feels. And, and that's something we haven't certainly seen in Washington in a long time. No, and, and from a law enforcement perspective, the fact that he brought 10 sheriffs in and his opening remarks were that of gratitude and respect – And there's been a long time since a lot of law enforcement agencies have gotten that message. Yeah. And and, and they guarantee at every level, whether it's federal, state, or local, and particularly he was speaking to the sheriffs, a spirit and a commitment of cooperation and communication and keeping Americans safe, keeping America safe, keeping our community safe. The message is consistent. We've seen politicians over these last eight so years really taking the side of the criminal taking the side of the rioter taking the side of everyone except law enforcement what do you expect to be the most different under a trump administration the treatment toward law enforcement and i think we're already seeing some of it but as we move forward as sensationalized cases come up across this country what will be the difference from president trump compared to what we've seen in recent years well, I think he, what he has done um, and is continuing to do is surround himself with really good people. For example, uh, General John Kelly, who was General Kelly, he's now Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. He, too, came and spoke to the sheriff. And his message was a very strong one of, we've got your back. So it's no longer a matter of guessing. It's a matter of knowing. And, you know, as the head of a law enforcement agency, um, my my concerns are always the men and women under my command. I want them to go home safe at night. I want that. I, I know when I've got deputies out on an early morning warrant service that could be very dangerous. And they're men and women that have kids at home, too. I have four young deputies that are new dads for the first time in the last year. And your heart is always with these men and women who go out every day in a bulletproof vest and put on a gun and a badge and serve and protect. 
And you know you have their back, but knowing that all the way up the line, all the way up to the office in the land, that when something happens, uh, he's going to have your back. And he made that clear. He made it abundantly clear. And so did Secretary Kelly. So I think they're going to see a different attitude in the respect and the gratitude and the cooperation with law enforcement. And I think it's going to be a refreshing change for the men and women on the street. You know, Sheriff, you impressed me those years ago when we sat down on television, and uh, obviously the president thinks highly of you, but also some in the administration have spoken about you. Lynn Patton, Katrina Pearson, everybody's a Bunny Welsh fan. It's good stuff. (laughs) Well, I met all the uh, Trump girls when they came into town. What a riot, even Diamond and Silk. Right, honorary sheriffs, right? Oh, yeah, I deputized all of them. We had a wonderful dinner in Philly, and I gave them all deputy badges, and we had a wonderful girls' night out, kind of. And and here's another thing, too. The respect that those women who have known and worked with Donald Trump for many years is astounding. So when somebody, and I get it, well, how can you be a woman and support this misogyny, all these, you know, the, the talking points that the other side has. You look at the women, Katrina Pearson, uh, uh, Lynn Patton, uh, all of the women that have worked around the, the, the most powerful, the woman, uh, Kellyanne Conway, who won the most powerful woman, as far as I'm concerned, in the country, who really made the city. And you look at the women who work with him and have worked to know him for years. They adore him. They adore him. That speaks volumes to the kind of man he really is. And that's why it's so disconcerting when you hear somebody make some of these, you know, canned comments about who he is, they really don't know who he is. Well, I know Patton and Pearson, you know, enjoyed meeting you. I, I wonder if Diamond and Silk took that honorary badge and put some jewels on it. You know, they, they, they probably did. Probably blinged it bling up. on everything. Sure. Even their coffee <laughs> mugs in our house. I mean, they sparkle and wake you up in the morning. But uh, yes, they're those, they're never those, shy. Those were, no, those two are funny. My grandson said to me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but mom, are they, did they keep saying, mm-hmm, and are they as funny off stage? <laughs> I said, they are just as funny over dinner as they are on YouTube. Now, my daughter was happy that I'm interviewing you because she loves that you're Sheriff Bunny. She thinks that's the greatest thing ever. <laughs> and my kids had a question for you. They want to know, how's the canine unit in Chester, and who's your top officers? Oh, well, I, I never pick a favorite. It's like a mom and her kids. Uh-huh. I'll tell you, we have... We have 10 canine deputies. One of their favorites may be a little dog we acquired this year. Uh, She's a little black uh, lab, and she was actually a reject. She was a a dog that was being trained to work as a senior. And um, unfortunately, she flunked because she was stealing food. (laughs) And that's that's a hard thing to break. So she was this wonderful dog, and we inherited her, and she has become a courthouse comfort dog. And what happens if children come in to testify or children are coming in 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 a custody case or maybe even an abuse case, and Melody goes up and visits with them, and they go in and and testify, and they know Melody's waiting for them outside. She has just brought smiles and joy and great comfort in the courthouse. So of the 10 dogs, and they're all wonderful, maybe their their uh, favorite might be the courthouse comfort dog. And she's a full uh, black lab. She's a black. Well, she's actually a, a lab uh, retriever mix. But okay. if you go on on the page, you'll see a dog with amber eyes and the sweetest disposition. And her job is to make people comfortable. And she really does that. And things have changed over the years, right? I mean, you used to always see German Shepherds. Now, I mean, I see labs. I've in Virginia, I met a, a a bloodhound. I mean, you see you see different breeds working. Yeah, well, uh, most dogs that usually the dogs used for work. Uh, they're used for their police work. There's drug dogs. There's a lot of labs. I eagles at the airport. Uh, uh, with searches. So a dog with a good nose is fine, but usually for police work on the street, a German Shepherd is your typical quote, unquote, police dog. Well, I have Rex. He's a lab mix, but he's little. He'll work for bacon, so we could talk off the air. (laughs) Um, I don't think he'd be good for that job at all, but I thought I'd ask for him. Bunny Welsh, the sheriff, Chester County, Pennsylvania, and just fresh off a meeting with 
the president of the United States, Donald J. Trump. Buddy, thank you so much for being with us. We really appreciate it. I hope to talk to you again as the administration moves forward and as things start to change back to law enforcement side uh, coming from Washington. Well, thank you very much, and it's my pleasure. For more on the great Bunny Welsh, visit SheriffWelsh.com. Now it's time for Sarah Palin News, headlines, and more about Governor Palin. Sarah Palin gives her take on the Super Bowl from the pregame to the big game to the gaga to the aftermath. Remembering Ronald Reagan on his birthday. A big happy birthday to Chuck Heath Jr., the governor's big brother. And a happy birthday to Alan West. Palin tells us why corporate America just doesn't get it. A grisly-sized endorsement for Alan Cobb, who's running for Congress from Kansas. Palin livid over the selfish and dangerous practice of businesses politicizing politicians or their families, visits, and announcing to the world their activities. A magical Palin throwback Thursday. The governor features my new article on Full Battle Rattle and the Battle Forge. Veterans are learning to play music, and they're learning the art of blacksmithing. A hysterical video sums up how far we have fallen In the media, the goofy, desperate press at it again. Palin tells the Trump administration to push back, bust through, get in. Don't let school bullies win. A warning shot at the GOP. Why Under Armour deserves our support. And it goes way beyond the fact that they make excellent products. Take it from me. Coach a lot of teams. And I know our football team has benefited from the great company. Lena Dunham continues to be gross while Reba McIntyre hits a home run. And it was Governor Palin's birthday this past week. We wish Governor Palin the happiest of years coming up. A big Mama Grizzly Radio happy birthday to Sarah Palin. To read more about all these stories, visit the Mama Grizzly Radio Facebook page. To see any of the governor's posts in their entirety and to read her devotionals, visit Sarah Palin's Facebook page. Follow her on Twitter at Sarah Palin USA. And don't miss the new Sarah Palin. Dot com. Now let's head to the crow's nest. Here's Tanya Crow. Thanks, Kevin. A word or a concept that kept coming to mind this week for me was exceptionalism. And then I was thinking about American exceptionalism, and in its classic form, American exceptionalism refers to the special character of the United States as a uniquely free nation based on democratic ideals and personal liberty. There is something so special about the preservation of that, the expression of that, and the ability to live your life with that kind of freedom. There's not that many places in the world that truly support that as a society, and we are one of those societies or should I say that we have been one of those societies the mechanism the government that we have as a constitutional republic that is built and made to support that kind of individual liberty has been chipped away at altered transformed And I cherish the exceptionalism of this society, this nation, this republic. And it makes my stomach turn to think that my daughter or her daughter or her children or her children's children may not live in the same society that I live in now. And this whole week I've been sick to my stomach with the thought that that could be a reality. And the fight to preserve that has never, ever been stronger than it is now. And I know I'm not alone in that. And it's worth fighting for. And God bless America. This is Tanya Crow with Mama Grizzly Radio. Tanya Crow on Mama Grizzly Radio. More from the Crow's Nest next week. Now on Target with Kelly Carlson. Thanks, Kevin. So I'm going to talk about a 1930s actress by the name of Hedy Lamarr. Hedy Lamarr was considered one of the most beautiful people at the time. More importantly, she was a very, very important inventor that we benefit today. But she had a very interesting story before she got to America. She was born in Austria. At 19 years old, she married a man 
named Fritz Mendel, who was an arms manufacturer for the Third Reich. You can imagine, he was a very, very wealthy man. They often, very often, hosted parties that were attended by Hitler himself, Mussolini, and all the scientists where they would discuss weapons manufacturing. Not only that, but um, tactics. They were very open because her husband did not give her the benefit of the doubt, let's just say. He didn't quite think she could comprehend the subjects they were discussing, uh, but unbeknownst to him, she copied a lot of those conversations onto napkins. True story, um, she loathed her husband and the Nazis. She drugged her husband one night and a maid who was hired to keep a watch on uh, Hedy Lamar. And she took the maid's clothing and she escaped. She went to London or Paris. It was one of the two where she ended up taking a flight to Los Angeles, becoming or actually continuing her career as an actress. It wasn't until she went to a party where there was a man there, a musician, playing the piano by the name of George and Teal. They struck up a conversation, and this is where Hetty came up with the idea of frequency hopping. George composed music, and he, and he used a self-playing piano that used a role that, was pre, that had pre-programmed music and that indicated what notes the piano should play. Now, this was a critical component to developing the frequency hopping. Those two got together and um, put together this idea of frequency hopping. Now, Hetty had, um, she was very focused on torpedoes. She did a lot, a lot of research on torpedoes. And the reason why she was searching for an answer for the torpedoes is because they could be easily jammed by the enemy. The frequency hopping that she came up with would make it near impossible to jam the torpedoes. So she takes it to the United States Navy where they basically laugh at her and they didn't quite understand the whole concept of the self-playing piano. They literally thought you needed an entire piano to, to frequency hop, which is kind of hysterical in and of itself, but they, they laughed her out of the room. And they literally told her, you're more suited to go sell war bonds, which she did, and I believe, let me see, what was the total amount? She sold over $25 million in bonds. And she figured any way she could contribute to um, national security, the military, is a step in the right direction. Um, li- shortly after that, um, Hedy Lamar and her, her co-inventor were awarded the patent on frequency hopping. It wasn't until the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962, I believed that this technology was actually brought into play by our military and is used today by all of us with GPS, Bluetooth, um, it, it plays such a huge part in our life. And it was all because of this woman who sat at dinner with Hitler and Mussolini, listening to them about torpedoes. And all she could think about is how she wanted to destroy these people. And then a simple twist of fate, she meets a pianist and finds a template for frequency hopping goes to the Navy, gets turned down, but signs over the patent anyways. And still to this day, even though she died in 2000, she never received a single dime for her invention. I love this because we don't hear about actors being patriotic or contributing to the country really in any well, there are some. There are some people that absolutely contribute. You just don't hear about them. People like Gary Sinise, John Voigt, who dedicate all of their free time to helping the military and law enforcement. But you just you don't hear about it. And you don't hear about Hedy Lamar and what she did. 
She literally invented a technology we all depend on every single day and has never received a dime for it and not really even a thanks. So I thought this was a great story about Hollywood um, contributing in such a, a beautiful way to this country. So this is Kelly Carlson for Mama Grizzly Radio. Tune in for more On Target next week. It's time for the Millennial Forecast. Here's Sarah Hagmeyer. Thanks so much, Kevin. Honestly, I am saddened to share with you this week's news because when you thought the progressive anti-Trump feminazi movement was revolting, they just became horrifyingly sickening. And I am absolutely appalled at who they're going after now. Because just the other week, we heard that Nordstrom's decided to drop Ivanka Trump's designer apparel line. And Nordstrom's will say that it was because of revenue and, you know, the line wasn't as successful, but we know it was all political. And they went after Ivanka, Ivanka Trump. She's a class act. She's a beautiful woman. She's a CEO. And she's a role model. She's a woman who built her brand and is raising a family. And this woman is inspiring. And I know millennials who are my age, and they specifically go and buy her brand of clothes when they work internships or when they have a job interview coming up because wearing her brand of clothes can give them the confidence they need because Ivanka Trump's whole platform is hashtag women who work. Her clothes, they're professional, they're sharp, they're sophisticated. I love them. They love them. And I actually brought, bought one of her shirts just the other day. But unfortunately, stores like Sears and Kmart, they're following in suit with Nordstrom's and calling off her line. TJ Maxx took down Ivanka Trump's sign the other day. And on top of that, the Grab Your Wallet movement is helping people boycott stores that sell Trump products. And they're mainly focusing on Ivanka Trump's merchandise so that the brand will eventually get dropped in the stores that sell her brand. And, like, how sad is that? When we live in a country and we thrive on capitalism and entrepreneurship and the American dream, and we have a website that helps Americans stop buying our president's family's brand that they created, and then on top of that, we have self-proclaimed feminists who are trying to dismantle an apparel line that a woman built herself this is absolutely insane and ridiculous and it has to stop now we are Americans and it's just horrible because that that means that this is Ivanka Trump and she's being unfairly targeted and her brand is being punished because of politics because she supports her father and her father wants to help our country. Her father is her blood. It's, it's just, it's so, it's, it's disheartening. But for millennials, we can definitely forecast that majority of the mo female millennials, they're just going to continue shopping at the cheap fast fashion stores to achieve their super trendy modern looks. But we do know that there's a nice portion of young ladies that will be Team Ivanka and support her label. So, happy shopping, Sister Grizzlies. For Mama Grizzly Radio, I'm Sarah Hagmar, and that was your Millennial Forecast. And next week, we'll have a new edition of the Millennial Forecast right here on the Palin Update. Now, the Palin Update with Kevin Shola presents Liberty and Legacy. Here's Tamara Colbert. Did any of you really think that President Obama was just going to leave office and quietly go away into a retirement oblivion? I certainly did not. And now we know that after a few short weeks of vacationing on a private Caribbean island with one of his pals, he's back back at the helm of his organizing for action, silently, but still there in the background. Hmm, I wonder how long he's really going to stay silent. 
Obama is claiming to have an army of agitators, over 30,000 who are ready to fight President Trump at every turn. And basically, we can see that they're there because that's what they've been doing since Inauguration Day on a variety of topics. And of According to sources, anonymous, of course, because with the progressives, they cannot do anything in daylight. Obama's little army, he's, he's growing it through a series of leftist nonprofits, a network led by his own Organizing for Action. Again, this was his former campaign arm, Obama for America, OFA. So right now, they're so well-funded, they have 250 offices around the nation. And OFA's website states they are not backing down and will salvage what is left of Obama's legacy. The group plans on drawing battle lines on immigration, Obamacare, race baiting, I mean race relations, and global warming. Obama is intimately involved in OFA operations, according to the New York Post, and has even been tweeting from the group's account, giving direct marching orders to the foot soldiers. OFA is currently run by old Obama aides and campaign workers, and the federal tax records show, quote, nonpartisan, nonpartisan. OFA marshals over 32,525 volunteers nationwide, registered as a 501c4, so they don't have to disclose their donors. They've raised more than 40 million in contributions and, quote, grants since evolving from Obama's campaign organization, Obama for America, in 2013. IRS filings say that OFA trains young activists to develop organizing skills. They are heavily armed with Obama's 2012 campaign database and plans to get out the vote for Democrat candidates coming up. They are itching to win a majority in Congress and put up their own, quote, wall of resistance around Trump. This new Obama Foundation and the National Democratic Redistricting Committee, oh, by the way, that was launched last month by his pal Eric Holder to end what he and Obama call, quote, gerrymandering of congressional districts. That should scare everyone. So Obama's going to be overseeing all of it from his house less than two miles from the White House. And by the way, folks, in case you didn't know, his office, his chief of staff and press secretary, who will be actively involved in all of this, are paid courtesy of the U.S. taxpayer as well as the rent and expenses for his office. Obama right now is eyeing the top spot at the Democrat National Committee for his civil rights chief, Tom Perez. (laughs) So much for Obama going quietly like every other ex-president. But what is the point? Why am I telling you this? I'm sharing this with you because right now the Convention of States Project is also organizing and training constitutional activists all over this nation. We are working with state legislators in every state in the country. We are working from the precinct on up to the capital of our states in all 50 states. We are serious about legislation. That is the Convention of States Resolution, working to call an Article 5 amending convention to fix once and for all the problems at the federal level. We don't ever want to be able to see our nation so close to the cliff of disaster again. And what most Republicans and conservatives fail to realize is that the Democrats are more hardcore than the mafia. Really, the mafia has nothing on the Democrat Party today. Because these guys are so ticked off with the fact they lost, they still can't believe it. I mean, I wish I could be a fly on the wall in one of their hate meetings. They must be just extraordinary in a bad way. They're meaner, ornerier, and more obstinate than ever. But they still didn't listen to what the American people said loud and clear on November 8th, 2016. We do not want socialist, progressive America. Period. We want to be left alone to do our own thing, to achieve, to dream, to create, to innovate, to succeed or fail on our own without any government interference. We don't want the IRS. We don't mind paying taxes, but it shouldn't be taxes that 20% of the American people pick up the tab for 85% of the rest of the country. That's just ridiculous. I actually don't believe the Democrats have even felt enough pain yet. And it's very evident they re-elected Nancy Pelosi as the minority leader in the House. The fact they're so riled up and rioting every day since Trump was sworn in confirms it. 
These progressives are, are just seething, working night and day, barely sleeping, trying to figure out a way to steal our government from us. And what's crack up is they thought they had it in the bag. They are not listening. They are imploding. But now that we know someone like Eric Holder has an organization to try to gerrymander districts to break up Republican strongholds and everything else should let us know exactly how serious they are. I used to live in California when it was Ronald Reagan Red California. And thanks to Bill Clinton in 2000, he took gerrymandering to a whole new level in that state. I mean, by 2010, other progressive groups were on the case. And now you have a handful, maybe a dozen Republican legislators in the entire state. That's why California is absolutely going into the abyss. And it's really sad because if you look at the downward spiral that California is on, the state's bankrupt, and the politicians don't care. Jerry Brown has yet to tax those one percenter Hollywood elites. But just wait, friends, it's coming, I promise you, because there's no more money. And Donald Trump is not going to give California any money. In fact, I believe very shortly we are going to see Donald Trump take federal money from the state of California. And I'm sad for all of my friends, my loved ones left in California. But you know what? It's time to restore the Constitution. That's all there is to it. And I can't wait to see the look on George Clooney and Barbara Streisand's faces when Governor Moonbeam tells them it's time for them to pay their, quote, fair share, which may be a 60 or 75 percent income tax for the state. <laughs> That's the new normal, right? For California, that is. But the new normal for us as conservative warriors is that we cannot ever go back to the armchair. We have got to keep working pressing onward toward complete victory and the banishment of the Democrat Party and its evil intentions. Because let's be clear, it's purely evil. Look at the people on the nightly news. Do these people look like they are normally functioning humanity? <laughs> Not even close. My goodness. We, we have to be on guard, vigilant, as our founders warned us. Obama is scheming every waking moment to sabotage Trump's presidency and continue to fundamentally transform this nation. They're either going to do it because they've got power or they're going to do it illegally through rioting and, and the courts. So we can't let him or his fake news activists gain any more ground. We've gained a lot. Trump has broken the system up by winning. So we've got to do our part. We've got to fight. We've got to put on the full armor of God and join the battlefield and pray for our nation, pray for President Trump, and pray that the Lord fights the battles you and I can't even see. Because it's going to take sacrifice and service above self for us to win. But for the love of God and country, we cannot waver. We cannot fail, folks. The soul of our nation is at stake. And doggone it, I'm not going to let my nation go by way of Eric Holder and some jerk. Give me a break. National Democratic Redistricting Committee. The Democrats, I got to give it to them. They're so good at taking language and, tr and transposing it and using it for other things so people get fooled. We are not fooled. We elected Donald Trump. We punished Hillary Clinton. We are banishing the Democrat Party. But folks, we haven't won until we have completely abolished them and transformed our nation back to constitutional self-governance. Here's the thing. You can join me at Convention of States right now, conventionofstates.com, to get your gear on, get trained, and get active right in your neighborhood, in your precinct, for your county, and in your state. We have more than 2.1 million activists, so I'd like to see my 2.1 million activists go up against Obama and his little 30,000 snowflakes any day of the week. I say bring it, pick the time and the place, and we are there. We are working right now in our state capitals to take back our states and to push back on the federal government and fix the things we need to fix now. And we can only do that, folks, through an Article 5 Convention of States. We can do it and it will restore the people's power and bring it back to the states and put Washington and the federal government in its small, tiny constitutional box. This is where the battle is. The real battle is in our states. So you know what? Let those little snowflakes go and cause havoc and, and cry and have to get puppies and coloring books and all that garbage. 
guess what? We are leading an army in all of our state capitals right now. There is nothing, not a snowflake's chance in you know what is going to stop us from restoring America. I say bring on the snowflakes because, baby, I have got the blowtorch and I am ready to tip the tables and win for our nation. Tweet me this week at Tamara Colbert, hashtag Mama Grizz Radio. God bless President Trump. God bless those who serve in our military and our first responders. Have a great week. It's Valentine's Day this week. So you know what? Love on somebody. Love on a service member. Thank your grocery clerk. Thank your mailman this week. And most importantly, thank you for standing up for America. And you're doing that by listening to Mama Grizzly Radio. We love you guys. Thank you so much for supporting and spreading the word. Please share Mama Grizzly on your Facebook pages. Tweet Kevin and I and the other awesome women who are part of this incredible truth broadcast. We need you and we need you to share what we are doing. You're part of it. And together we're going to save this nation. We are going to fully restore America and make it truly great. Again, I'm Tamara Colbert for Mama Grizzly Radio. Tamara Colbert in Texas. Tune in for more Liberty and Legacy next week. And to learn about Convention of States, head to conventionofstates.com. The Palin Update, including Liberty and Legacy, the Millennial Forecast, On Target, and the Crow's Nest is on demand and available for download. So just head to mamagrizzlyradio.com, pick the show you want to hear, and you can listen anywhere, anytime. Well, that'll just about do it for this edition of the Palin Update on Mama Grizzly Radio. Visit mamagrizzlyradio.com for continuing coverage of Governor Palin. Also, like Mama Grizzly Radio on Facebook and follow along on Twitter at Mama Grizz Radio, at Kevin Shola, at Tamara Colbert, at Tanya Yoga 13, at S. Hagmeyer 2, and at FB. R-A-B-Q. And I'm doing some writing for Breitbart News. Just go to Breitbart.com and search Kevin Shola. I'm also contributing to SarahPalin.com. Please check out my latest piece this week. Honored to be working on the governor's new site. I want to thank Tamara Colbert, Tanya Crow, Kelly Carlson, Sarah Hagmeyer, and everyone here at Mama Grizzly Radio. Thanks to Sheriff Bunny Welsh. And thank you for listening today. A special thanks to our sponsor, Full Battle Rattle. Visit Facebook.com slash Full Battle Rattle ABQ. The Palin Update is produced by Lena Anderson, the Andy L. Kramer, and Lorianne Lewis. Happy birthday, Lorianne. Please be sure to join us again next time for another edition of the Palin Update right here on Mama Grizzly Radio. I'm Kevin Shola. Have a pleasant day.